the subject of medical ethics is not an easy subject to deal with, but we need to realize that the Bible has all the answers as to living righteously, that it has all of the prob uh, it has all of the answers to every moral and religious need and question that might arise that we might face. That's at least one of the many passages that teach such would be Second Peter one verse three and verse four, where Peter says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so the Bible gives us everything that we need to make decisions regarding life and godliness. Our, those moral issues uh, are going to be dealt with in the Bible. And that includes medical issues that we might face. Now then, we might wonder as to how a book that was written about 2,000 years ago could deal with some of the questions that arise today seeing the advances that we have seen within the medical realm. And the answer is that it sets forth principles by which when we properly apply those principles we can determine what is right and what is wrong. I really believe that is what Paul is talking about when he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and he uses the word reproof uh, when he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Well, that word reproof deals with the proving of what is right and what is wrong. How do we prove what is right? How do we prove what is wrong? from God's standpoint in relationship to some of these medical situations that arise for us today? And the answer is that it sets forth the principles by which we take those principles and apply them and thus we can determine what is right and what is wrong. We reprove the script, uh, from the scriptures. Well, when we, I believe that there are three maybe you can say four, depending on how you want to count one of them. Uh, but basically three principles by which we determine the majority of medical ethics. We looked at the first last week, and that is the sanctity of human life. Realizing that God made man in his image, and thus the unjust taking of human life would be wrong. <clears throat> and that would include all of its forms, and we'll get into the application of these uh, later on, but probably not today, but uh, in next study possibly. The second that we started talking about is the honor, the dignity, and the respect of man. God created man in his in his image. Man did not evolve from a lower life form as the evolutionist would have us to believe. Instead, as <coughs> Moses writes in Genesis 1, 26 and, 20, <coughs> me, 26 and 27, <coughs> that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. When James is discussing the use of the term, the tongue, the proper and improper use of the tongue, he says in chapter 3 and verse 9, that therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, who are, which are made after the similitude of God. And so he sets forth that man was made after the similitude of God, after the likeness of God. We're made in his character. And so as we go back to creation, God, of course, created man, placed him in the garden. In chapter 1 of Genesis and verse 31, it states that God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and morning were the sixth day. Notice that statement, that it was very good. God saw his creation, including man. And this is after God's statement in verses 26 and 27 about creating man in his own image. And now then he pronounces that his creation is good. And not only good, it is very good. And so he's setting forth that this idea, this principle of the dignity of man and his dominion over the, this world and all of the things of this world is very good. During this time, God and man had continual fellowship. We see this in Genesis 3 and verse 8, because it sets it forth as a custom that God and man were enjoying fellowship with each other. Sometimes we ask the question, or we have someone ask us, well, why did God make man? create man. And while the Bible does not state specifically, I believe we see a principle here that God is a social being, to use that phrase uh, maybe in the way in which we oftentimes use it. He wanted fellowship with others. And God enjoyed that fellowship with man, his creation, Thus, the reason for creating man was not simply for man to glorify him, but for God to have fellowship with man. We see this again, Genesis 3 and verse 8, when it says, They heard, talking about Adam and Eve now, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. It presents it as here is a common custom of the, here's God coming to have fellowship, commune with Adam and Eve, his creation. On this occasion, of course, they hid themselves because they had committed sin. But prior to that, they had not been spoiled by sin, and thus God and man had this fellowship one with another. But of course, Sin does come into the world. God, in that creating man, gave him the power to choose right from wrong. And man chose error, sin. Satan, of course, comes along and tempts Eve. She chooses to disobey God, Genesis 3, verses 1 through 6 that the serpent was more subtle than the beast of the, any of the beasts of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Another lesson dealing with that would 
very simply be that God does give a message to man and man can understand God's message as Adam and Eve were able to understand what God told them. So man today is able to understand what God says. Now he may not, he may refuse to understand it, but he can understand it. But that's another lesson. But the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took there, uh, the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Notice Satan used the three avenues of temptation that were open to him, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, as recorded uh, by John in 1 John 1 and verse, or 2 and verse 16. He used that in relationship to Eve, and Eve succumbed to that temptation. Sin, though, thus she and he, because Adam likewise did eat, sin brought a multitude of evils with it. God, now that he has come, they've hid themselves, and because they were naked, even though they had clothed themselves, uh, they still recognized they were, their nakedness, and God recognized their nakedness, and thus he made coats of skin for them. But also God pronounced upon Adam and Eve certain consequences that came as a result of their disobedience. Notice Genesis 3, verse 16 through verse 19. <clears throat> and under the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Women, you want to complain about uh, pain and childbirth, blame Eve. Uh, unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of, thy, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of the fate, thy face shalt thou eat bread. Till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So, farmers, when you see all of those weeds coming up, blame Adam and Eve. Uh, but also notice physical death as comes as a result of sin. Now God created man a mortal being, but man had access to the tree of life while he remained in the garden. And having access to that tree of life, he could eat and continue to live. He was because of sin, cast out from that garden, and God placed cherubim so that he could not enter into the garden and eat of the tree of life and live. And thus death came upon man. Thus thou art dust, dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So there are certain consequences from a physical standpoint that came as a result of sin. As we go along in Genesis, we see that sin continued to abound. We come to Genesis, the sixth chapter. And in verse 6, it says that it repented the Lord that he had made, <coughs> made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Why? Because of the proliferation of sin. 
The thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually, and as a result, it grieved God. He was sorrowful because of man's decisions to engage in sin. And so we would see in Genesis 6 and verse 3 that the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. Some have misinterpreted that verse and taken it out of its context and say, well, why don't men live today to be 120? Well, that's not what it's talking about. God had determined to destroy the world. Notice verse 7. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. God had determined to destroy the world. When is he going to do it? 120 years. He was going to wait patiently during that time while the ark was preparing, wherein Noah, along with uh, his family, were saved by water. But that period of time in which he gave Noah to build the ark is going to be 120 years to the saving of his soul and, of course, the animals. But God, in determining to destroy the world, destroyed it with a flood. God sent a global flood upon the earth. He spared righteous Noah and his family. Uh, got into a discussion just recently dealing with the global flood or whether it was a localized flood. I said, and it was never answered, even though somebody said that they would, that if it was a local flood, God lied to us. Because God said, I will not destroy the world by water again, and gave us a promise by the rainbow. If it was a local flood, have there been local floods since that time? Have there been any local floods in your time in which that area, a certain area was destroyed? Well, of course there have. Thus, God lied if it was only a localized flood. If it was a localized flood, why would there be any need to build an ark for Noah and his family? To save all of the animals. There would have been animals in other places. But it's obvious that it was a global flood. But that flood destroyed what is called the water vapor canopy that was above the earth. There was a separation at creation of the waters above the earth and below the earth. A water vapor canopy it surrounding the world. It uh, basically it would be a greenhouse effect. You go into a greenhouse, there's a constant temperature because of the water vapor that is in that greenhouse. But that water vapor canopy that was upon the, above the earth it would prevent the harmful effects of the sun to reach the earth. They would be repelled by the, the water. That's why prior to the flood you see the ages of those patriarchs living to the 900 year range. The harmful effects of the sun were not seen upon their bodies. After the flood, though, you start seeing them drastically cut off and going down to where now the 70 or 80 years. And there's no way for us to escape the harmful effects of the sun and its rays, the harmful rays affecting us. But those harmful effects of the sun brings additional ills brings afflictions, sufferings, 
get out in the sun too much, what do they tell you? Use sunscreen. Why? Because of the harmful effects of the sun upon the skin. And if you don't use it, then you can expect to have cancer of the skin when you get older. Why? Because of the harmful effects of the sun. The water vapor canopy protected the people of that day from those effects. And thus, when that water vapor canopy was destroyed by the flood, you then had the harmful effects of the sun beginning to take effect and the age of man beginning to reduce. But when we start considering these things in light of what we began with, the honor and dignity of man, we start recognizing that it is right for man to improve his health. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8, Paul makes a statement that bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. A lot of times people who don't want to exercise will use this verse and say, See, I don't need it because it profiteth little. Well, that sounds good. <laughs> and a lot of us like to use that and think that way, don't we? But notice that it profiteth little. That means it does profit some, doesn't it? If it profits little, then it is making some profit. There is value to bodily exercise even though we might not like it too much or enjoy it. But if there is profit to bodily exercise, what is that doing? That is improving our health. Trying to improve that health. Now then, he makes a comparison. It's little as opposed to godliness. Godliness is what is really of value. But there is the value of, at least to a certain extent, the physical body and taking care of it and then trying to improve our health. Jesus authorizes going to a doctor to regain one's health. In Matthew 9 and verse 12, he, uses, he states unto him, but when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that are behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. In other words, when you're sick, you go to the doctor, the physician. What would be the purpose of going to the physician if not to improve our health? Luke is referred to as the blood physician by a Paul in Colossians 4 and verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Notice that Luke was the beloved physician after the New Testament times and after he was a New Testament Christian. Luke did not have to stop being a physician in order to become a Christian or in order to be a Christian. Again, a physician's job and the reason you have physicians is to improve our health. Thus, we start learning that those things that will improve our health are thus authorized by God. That would include things such as today, blood transfusions, taking medication, the proper medication, surgeries, organ transplants, and other types of things that would improve our health and be a benefit to our physical bodies. However, having said that, we also need to realize that man is not an animal to be experimented on. While we can improve our health, the human body is not to be experimented on like an animal. God made man as he desired. 
He created us in His image. In the 139th Psalm in verse 14, the psalmist says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and thy soul knoweth right well. God made us in a marvelous, a wondrous, wonderfully way. To try to change or alter God's design is to go beyond what is right or what is moral and would thus be wrong. Thus, the dignity the hu uh, or the uh, honor or the respect of man is a principle that we must apply in looking at medical ethics just as the sanctity of human life would be. The third principle, and I don't know if we'll get through this this afternoon or not, would be the sacredness of the family unit. God saw the need of the family unit. Genesis 2 and verse 18, after the creation of Adam, it says that the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make for him or make him a helpmeet for him. Some have stated that the only thing that God said that was not good in the creation was an old bachelor. Well, that's the idea that is being presented here that God saw it's not good that man should be alone. Man needed a helpmeet, one that was suitable for him. I think it's interesting that this statement in Genesis 2.18 is followed by God making all of the animals pass before Adam. Notice verse 20 of Genesis 2 that Adam then gave names to all cattle and to, all, and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. I learned something from this, that animals are not a proper help meet for man. Now then, it would seem like that common sense would tell us that, but sadly there are those who practice bestiality today and thus it needs to be stated. God said, you make a help me. All the animals pass before Adam, he names them. There's not found among all the animals a help meet for him. And so what? Verse 20 and 21 or 21 and 22. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof, or closed the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. Thus God made a, ma a woman for the man to be that help meet, that one that would be suitable for man. We also learn thus that homosexuality is wrong. It is contrary to what God's design is, just as much as bestiality would be. That both of them are wrong and sinful, God made a woman for the man, not a man. And some have said God did not make Adam and Steve, God made Adam and Eve. Well, that's true. And later on, when we come to Genesis 19th chapter, we see God's view regarding homosexuality by his destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain. But in the creation of Adam and Eve, 
creating woman to be a helpmeet for the man and bringing Eve to Adam, God is sanctioning the marriage relationship. And God still joins an eligible man and an eligible woman in the bonds of holy matrimony today. Notice Matthew, the 19th chapter, verses 5 and verse 6. When it says, and, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. What therefore, or wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Who joined them together? Well, it's the preacher, obviously, who stands up there and says, I now pronounce you man and wife. No, it's not. Or sometimes the preacher will say, by the authority of the state. I pronounce, no, it's not by the authority of the state. Now then, we do need to obey the laws of the land as they are right in that marriage relationship. But it, the one who joins them together is God. And the wording that's used here in the original, and I'm not going to try and get into the arguments as to the terminology and all of that, but it basically is saying that God hath joined them together and when it says, let not man put asunder, he is basically saying that man can try to put it asunder, but man cannot accomplish it. God's the one who joins them together. And if we understood that very basic principle, and the fact that God joins them together, man, as much as he might try, cannot unjoin them, cannot separate them, or put them asunder. Man can't do it. Who's going to do it then? Well, God joined them. Only God can unjoin them. Only God is the one who can put them asunder. If we understood that principle, it would solve a lot of the marriage, divorce, and remarriage problems that we have in the church today. But seemingly, we can't get that idea through a lot of people's heads. But you see, God is the one who authorized the marriage relationship and God is still involved in sanctioning those marriages today when an eligible man marries an eligible woman. Now, if a man or a woman is not eligible, then God will not join them together if either one of them is not eligible. Now, that goes into what does the scriptures teach about eligibility in relationship to marriage. And not to get off into that study, but just simply to set forth that there are three classes that God sets forth are eligible for marriage. One, someone who has never been married. Two, someone who has lost their spouse because of death. And the third is someone who has put away their spouse because the spouse committed fornication. That individual, the one who put away their spouse for fornication, has the right to marry. The guilty party, by the way, is never given that right. And thus, you have three categories of people that have the right to get married. Now, if someone does not fall into that category, then they have no right to get married, and God will not join them in marriage. God will only join those who are eligible to marry. But we also see the importance of the home in this. There's the old adage, as the home goes, so goes the nation. And we're seeing that in our society today, but we've seen it in every society and at all times. As the home goes, so goes the nation. One changed it, though, 
to state, as the family goes, so goes the nation, and so goes the world in which we live. Well, they just elaborated on the first statement to take it beyond the nation to the world. And that's right. Wayne Jackson said that the ultimate thrust of the home is spiritual. And then he gives five benefits of the family unit. The first of those benefits is it provides an atmosphere of companionship. And he used Genesis 2 and verse 18 that says that the Lord God said it is not good that man should be alone. I will make for him, uh, I will make a helpmeet for him. It's not good that he be alone. There needs to be companionship. With, and that is part of the reason of getting married. That's part of the reason of a family unit. The atmosphere of companionship. Second, he said... It is the sphere wherein the sexual appetites of the body can be morally satisfied. And we see that, and he used 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 2, that says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. And he goes on to teach in the next few verses that a man is not to defraud his wife, nor the wife defraud the husband. That's dealing with the sexual realm. And the only exception to that would be the aspect of you consent for a season, for a period of time, and then you come together again. But that Consenting for a period of time was for spiritual reasons, verse 5. But the sexual desires of man can be satisfied, according to God's will, within that marriage relationship. The third thing that he says is that it stabilizes social relationships and enhances international solidarity. And we do realize from a looking at society and looking at marriage, it does stabilize those social relationships. It does enhance these things. Fourth thing that he says is that it is the divinely planned method of introducing children into the world. And he mentioned Genesis 4 and verse 1 that says, uh, and Adam knew his wife, or knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And then in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 14, it states, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. And so the idea of bringing children into the world, what's needed? The family unit. And sadly, we've seen the destruction of that family unit and bringing children into the world without the family unit and the damage that it causes our society. But then he said fifth thing was the family unit was planned to provide a warm atmosphere of love and trust, an ideal environment for spiritual growth. God, Jehovah, is described in the New Testament in particular as our Father. That should tell us something about that marriage relationship, that family unit in which there's that spiritual atmosphere that that child learns about God from his father because God likens himself to a father. It's sad that some fathers are not doing what God wants them to do in leading and having the type of love that he ha should have for his children. And thus, the destruction, continued destruction of the family unit. But the family unit does provide that place of warm, love, trust, 
that is to be developed and is developed within that family relationship and the spiritual growth that can come in that family relationship. Then the importance of this family unit and this marriage relationship is seen in that marriage is to be for life. As we mentioned in Matthew 19 and verse 5 and 6, that God joins them. Man, even if he tries, cannot put it asunder. Man, is he is saying, is not even to attempt thus to put it asunder. He cannot accomplish it. He should not even attempt it. In Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 10 and 11, or 11 and 12, I mean, he says, or Jesus saying, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Why? Because God intended that marriage relationship to be for life. And thus, if you put away some your spouse, whether it be a man or a woman putting away their spouse and marry someone else, you're committing adultery. And I wish I had time to discuss the specific words that he used here. Committing adultery. Why is it adultery? What is adultery? It's adultery, and it is specifically adultery because they're still married. They put them away, though, but God says they're still married because adultery is someone who's married. If it's not someone who's married, then it's fornication. But God didn't use fornication. He said it's adultery. Now then, God does allow one to one and only one exception to that law that is set forth in Mark 10. And that is when the spouse commits fornication. Matthew 19 and verse 9, I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So you have an exception to that general rule. That's the only exception in, that God gives. That is, if the spouse commits fornication, then you have the right to put that spouse away and you will not be committing adultery if you marry again. Otherwise, you will be. Now then, any attempt to circumvent the home as God intended it and that family unit is morally wrong and must be opposed. Now then, Lord willing, next Sunday, not next Sunday afternoon, but the following, since next Sunday will be the singing, that's our fifth Sunday singing, we'll get into in, the intent and then make, start making some applications of these principles. But God has given us these things in order to, and he provided for man the marriage relationship so that within that family unit, children can be brought up to learn trust and love and the things of God, the principles that God sets forth for us. And thus learn about God and become faithful Christians. Becoming a faithful Christian by obedience to the gospel and then living the type of life that he sets forth. But that's going to be aided by a proper family unit. Now, if you have not become a Christian, then you need to become such. If you haven't lived the type of life that God wants you to live, then you need to repent. Let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins and start living the type of life that God wants you to live. So if you need to come this afternoon in response to the invitation, then why not do so as we stand and sing the invitation song?